So given the lack of time, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time explaining the algorithms, but I do wanna kind of introduce to you the main steps in the algorithm so you see how it's related to um, the computation and then for related to issues of scalability with the computation. So I'm gonna start with uh, iterative methods for uh, linear systems and then work our way over to uh, nonlinear systems. And then I'm gonna give you a little, very high level view of uh, the PETC package which is an algebraic solver package, and then uh, start uh, briefly uh, start you on um, a couple of examples that can be run. So if we're um, considering uh, uh, large algebraic systems um, where the size of the vectors goes from say 10 to the third to 10 to the 12th, it's often advantageous to use iterative methods in, instead of direct methods because for direct methods, the work in general, unless you're a very special case, is um, at least uh, some constant times uh, n squared. So that means if you want to solve 10 to the 12th unknowns, you're doing 10 to the 24th uh, work, which is kind of unrealistic uh, for the computers we have today. So starting with the simplest possible uh, approach for um, iteratively solving linear systems, there's something called simple iteration or Richardson, where all you do is you take your uh, current solution, um, you compute your uh, current residual from your current solution, and then you just use that as an update for your, next, um, for your next solution. And it turns out if you do this, simple algebraic calculation shows that the error in the, um, after the next iteration is I minus A times error in the previous iteration. So on, only under very specific circumstances will this even converge if this, uh, operator here is a contractive operator, so it contracts the E. Otherwise, the iteration won't even converge, which is generally true. So there's a concept of, of preconditioning uh, iterative solvers where you introduce another operator, B, and after you compute the residual, you apply the B operator and then use that as your update. Now, um, if B is exactly A inverse, then this converges in one iteration because this is a residual, this is the error from the residual, so you get the perfect update and the next error is exactly zero. Of course, you're generally not gonna have the application of the inverse, but the whole idea behind preconditioners is they're inexpensive, some kind of relatively inexpensive way of approximately applying the inverse of the operator. And once you have such a preconditioner, then you can use Richardson to solve the system. So examples of uh, very simple preconditions are uh, damped Richardson, where you just dampen, apply a lambda here that's less than one, and hope that this is converges, or you can do something like using the inverse of the diagonal of A as your preconditioner and hope that that converges. Often this still will not converge, and even if it does converge, it may converge slowly. So there's a concept of accelerating convergence. So we notice that this iteration here is actually equivalent to saying that xn plus one is some linear combination of powers of um, the preconditioner times the right hand side and then multiplied by ascending powers of b times a. Or another way of saying the exact same thing is that your xn plus one solution is in the span defined by this space here. So the space starts with the right hand side preconditioned now, if the preconditioner is perfect, then this, of course, is exactly the solution. And then we multiply by BA times that and so forth and building it up. So rather than using the particular combination that comes from Richardson, we could define Xn plus 1 to be exactly the value that's in the span of this space that minimizes the residual with the preconditioner applied to the residual. So it turns out that there's a very clever way to, uh, to do this optimization problem inexpensively. What, what essentially it does is it constructs an orthonormal basis for the Kn by starting with the first value and normalizing it. And then just each of the new directions is, the, is that new direction with one more power of b times a orthogonalized against all the previous directions as we build it up. And if you do this and you do a little clever trick for uh, minimizing in this basis, you end up with something called the generalized minimum residual algorithm. 
which is sort of the standard Krylov algorithm for generic problems for solving um, linear systems. So the operations that, these, that this um, algorithm requires are, well, you need to do inner products because you have to do the orthogonalization. You need to compute norms because you have to normalize these guys. These require global reductions across whatever part of the parallel machine you're using that you're solving the linear system on. And then there's vector updates that are again come from the orthogonalization process. These are embarrassingly parallel. There's no communication at all in those, so that's great. And then there's the application of the uh, matrix vector product. And if the matrices are sparse and coming from PDEs, then almost always these just require nearest neighbor communication between processes. The application of the preconditioner B can go from having no communication at all. So for example, the block Jacobi preconditioner I showed you on the previous slide, you don't have to do any communication. Or it can require a great deal of communication. So for example, algebraic multigrid, this step requires a, a great deal of communication. So there's a couple other things to observe that as, as you're iterating, you actually have to collect all these queues and store them. And for each new queue, you have to orthogonalize against the previous queues. Uh, if your iteration doesn't converge in a few iterations, then this is going to require quite a bit of memory and quite a bit of computation. So there's something called restarted GM res, which says after a certain number of iterations, say 30, I'm just going to throw away all my queues and start over again with the current solution that I have and then build up a new uh, Krylov space with the new directions here. Um, also, for extremely scalable machines, the inner products and the norms actually become the bottleneck. Even though there's very little computation involved, it requires a synchronization across the entire machine, a hard synchronization as it accumulates the sums from all the individual processes and, and collects them together. So there's methods called pipeline GM, GM res methods where what they do is they kind of delay the actual accumulation of these global reductions until they're doing another matrix vector product and application of the preconditioner. And so what you can do is you can overlap the time that you need to wait for these values to accumulate across the entire machine with the computations that take place here. So starting depends on the machine, depends on the problem and so forth. Starting with about 10,000 cores, it sometimes is beneficial to use these pipeline methods. And if you start getting millions of cores, the pipeline methods in general pay off. Otherwise, you'll find that most of the time of your uh, solution process is spent in these inner products, even though most of the work is actually in the other parts. OK, there's a couple other Krylov methods that are very commonly used. If your problem is symmetric positive definite, you'll want to use a conjugate gradient method. It has the advantage that, though it does the similar orthogonalization as GM res, there's actually a really nice three-term recurrence for that. So you don't actually have to store anything more than two steps going back in time. You don't have to store all the cues that you need for GM res. And so at each step, it only requires two inner products in an optional norm. It doesn't require inner products related to the size of your restart. And then there's a generalization, you could think of it as a generalization of conjugate gradient method called biconjugate gradient stabilized, which is for non-symmetric problems, general matrices. And it also has a short recurrence relation, so it doesn't require having a restart. It requires a two or three inner products, depending on how you write it at each iteration. But its convergence is not as good at GMRES. So generally, if you have uh, a really good preconditioner, say algebraic multigrid that you learned about, that you'll learn about later today, you'll want to use GM res because you only need a handful of iterations, 10, 15 iterations if you're lucky. But if you don't have a really good preconditioner for your problem and you end up using, needing hundreds of iterations, then generally you want to use by CG stab um, instead because it's just cheaper than uh, GM res. Okay, so now. I'm going to talk by analogy for nonlinear problems. So you see the same types of computations are needed for solving large scale nonlinear problems as are needed for uh, solving the linear systems. So just considering uh, solving the nonlinear system f of x equals b. Now, of course, this b is completely artificial. I could always make the b zero and subtract it off on the other side. But I write it this way 
for a variety of reasons, but one is just for the analogy with uh, linear systems. So you can do a simple nonlinear Richardson iteration where you evaluate the, the residual of this function, b minus f, you damp it by some amount, and you use that as a correction, and then you hope that it converges. In the best case, that when it does converge, you get this kind of uh, convergence. So you'll get that the norm of the error after the next step is maybe 0.95 times the norm of the previous one, or 0.99. Of course, if this c is bigger than one, it's not even converging. So there's a way to accelerate this, simple iteration. There's a few ways to do that. The two most commonly talked about are what's called nonlinear CG. And what that does is it tries to mimic the conjugate gradient approach for um, the new search direction to um, hope that it'll converge faster than not in using nonlinear CG. So I, I, didn't, I didn't mention one thing that I should have um, with GMRES and CG. One, one way of thinking about why they work well is with both GMRES and CG, just in different, in different uh, norms and inner products that you measure with, what you do at each step is you essentially take a new direction as given by a formula like this or with the preconditioner attached, and then you orthogonalize it against either the previous direction or all the previous directions. So it makes sure you're never going back in the same way you tried the previous time. And what this tries to do is do the same kind of thing for nonlinear problems. We just force the new direction to be orthogonal to the, to the two or one or two previous directions and hope that helps with convergence. And surprisingly, it actually works quite well for many problems. Now, there's another approach called uh, Anderson mixing, or you could also call it nonlinear GM res, where what you do is you say, for each of the uh, xn plus one, I'm gonna do the same process I did for GM res. I'm gonna try to find an xn plus one that minimizes this guy by using a linear combination of my previous solutions. So it's a lot like GM res, where you build up this space that's like a Krylov space, and um, it turns out there's a little formula you can use, just like with Jim Res, that it's not too expensive to solve this um, minimization problem. And if you're really lucky in your problem, you actually get convergence like this. So the error at the next iteration is some constant times the error at the previous iteration squared. Uh, sorry, not, squ not, not squared, but bigger than one. So maybe 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.5, which is much faster convergence than you can get with this for the same C. So finally, there's Newton's method, which I'm sure uh, most of you are familiar with, where you update the solution by evaluating your current function, linearizing and solving with the, the linearized system called the Jacobian, and then use that as an update, possibly with a damping or a line search. In the Generally, the best case scenario, you end up with a convergence like this, where the new error norm is less than some constant times the previous error norm squared. And the square is really important because it means very fast convergence. So if your current error is, say, 10 to the minus 3, and you take one step, if you're in the region where this is converging quadratically, your next error is 10 to the minus 6. Take one more step, your error is 10 to the minus 12. So fantastic. You generally need very few iterations when you're using Newton's methods. Unlike with these methods where you generally need probably dozens or even hundreds of iterations. So what's the drawback to, to using Newton's method? Well, first of all, you have to compute this Jacobian or some approximation to this Jacobian. And you have to store it, which requires a lot of memory probably. And then you also have to approximately solve a linear system with that. So the operations required for nonlinear iterative solvers are largely the same as for the linear solvers. You have the inner products and norms. You have, again, the vector updates. You have to compute the f function as opposed to a matrix vector product, but that's OK. The f function is, again, for PDEs, generally um, requires only nearest neighbor communication. You have to compute this Jacobian. To compute the Jacobian again, all you need is nearest neighbor communication. Pretty much the same data that you have to communicate to evaluate the F, you can use 
to evaluate the Jacobian. But then, of course, the Jacobian is, a very, is expensive to compute. And when you're using Newton's method, you have to do these approximate linear solves. If you're using the methods that are not Newton-based, like these methods, then you avoid the computation of the J's and you avoid the linear solves and you only have these costs, which pretty much map to what you have for um, the linear case. So the takeaways for uh, the material here on, on iterative solvers are Krylov methods are used to accelerate simple iterative schemes and the commonly used ones are GMRES, CG by CG stab. There's actually dozens of other ones. Uh, packages like Petsy and Trolino implement many of them. In my experience, you really rarely need any but these three. You can always try the other ones and see if they help, but generally I don't think they really help. Nonlinear solvers range from simple iteration, which converges generally really slowly or not at all, to Newton's method, which converges much faster. But the amount of work that's needed goes from just function evaluations for simple iteration to evaluating Jacobians and uh, solving linear systems for Newton's methods. And the important part for this presentation is the components in terms of software for the linear and nonlinear solvers are similar. And the key points are there's embarrassingly parallel vector operations, which is great. There's global reductions that are based on inner products and norms, not so great because you have this global synchronization every time you need to do norms. The matrix vector products and function evaluations require just nearest neighbor communication. Jacobian evaluations require only nearest neighbor evaluations. And preconditioners can be either embarrassingly parallel or really strongly coupled. And if you're really running at large scale, then you really want to avoid global reductions or you, what you want to do is delay the need for the global reductions so that you can overlap it with other work and um, other local communication. And there's algorithms called uh, pipelined uh, GMRES, pipeline CG. There's many different algorithms people are developing to do this pipelining in different ways. Um, there's one final point which I don't have on the slide uh, which relates to the previous talk um, on higher order methods is these embarrassingly parallel vector operations, even though they're embarrassingly parallel, they are vector operations. So they're Blas 1 operations, which means that the work intensity is pretty low. That means the flop rates for these are not particularly high. Similarly, inner products are just evaluating um, the, a vector, e each component of a vector with each component of another vector. And again, the uh, flop rates are not high because there's just not very much work intensity compared to the amount of memory access that you need. The same thing is true for nearest neighbor matrix vector products when you explicitly form the matrices. If, if you explicitly form the matrices and store them as sparse, as sparse matrices, again, this is um, low arithmetic intensity, so the flop rates are low. Function evaluations, well that depends completely on your function. If you're using a high order discretization and you're smart in how you implement it, then this can have very high arithmetic intensity as was talked about in the previous presentation. So that's good. Um, Jacobian evaluations, if you form them, again, if you form the matrix explicitly, these tend to have relatively low um, arithmetic intensity because you actually have to take the values and store them in the sparse matrix. And then when you use them here in uh, your nearest neighbor matrix vector products, they're low intensity. So often what people will try to do is do a matrix free application of the Jacobian. And then again, if you're using high order methods, this can be of high arithmetic intensity so it can perform well. The tricky part is always having good preconditioners um, to actually accelerate the convergence or even get the linear systems to converge. So there's a variety of, of uh, HPC software packages out there for um, both iterative solvers and ODE integrators. Uh, I'm gonna say a few words about Petsy and uh, Carol will talk later about um, Sundials which is an o ODE and nonlinear solver um, package.
Trilinos is a very large package from Sandia that does many of these things. Then um, Hyper, which isn't listed here, someone will talk about that later, which provides a variety of iterative solvers, including algebraic multigroup. So Petsy tries to provide a, a full software stack for uh, doing numerical simulations for all the portions of the simulation related to um, algebraic solvers, ODE integrators, and optimization. It doesn't provide a full stack for mesh operations in that portion. There, you, you want to use a package like MFAM or the packages Mark uh, Shepard talked about or other uh, mesh, pack, mesh and finite element packages for that. So the software stack is handling in a distributed way very scalable matrices and vectors, then uh, scalable preconditioners, scalable Krylov solvers, which I just talked about briefly, scalable nonlinear algebraic solvers, time integrators, and then on top of that, optimization. In the evening, Hung Zhang is going to give a talk where he ties this optimization to an integration to all the pieces underneath for uh, um, PDE constrained optimization problem. It shows how all the pieces can be used together. Petsy also has something called the DM, which are domain specific interfaces for managing the communication between the algebraic solvers and the ODE integrators and the optimization algorithm and the underlying discretization mesh that you're using. So for example, we have one for handling things like electri electrical networks, gas uh, pipeline networks, and so, so forth. Something for handling octrees, uh, something for communicating with unstructured mesh, and something for communicating with mesh. This doesn't mean that we're providing the unstructured mesh infrastructure. It means we provide a mapping between what you need to do with the unstructured mesh interface in order to do the algebraic computations that you need. Uh, for our software stack at the optimization level, we provide uh, ways of solving PDE constrained optimization problems. You'll hear about that tonight. Uh, solving optimization problems when you can't compute the derivative because it, it may not, um, it may not be well defined or it may just be too expensive to, to ever compute it. And then for time integrators, we have a variety of methods. Uh, for nonlinear um, algebraic solvers, we have Newton method. And then we have a variety of uh, simpler methods um, that are sort of related to what I talked about earlier in the presentation. And then we have, as I said, dozens of Krylov methods. You should generally stick to GMRES, CG, and by CG stab. Okay, so in the lessons page, if you can go there, you'll, you'll see there's a section, Iterative Solvers. So I'm going to pop down to that one and bring up the, uh, my terminal. So the examples for um, the Krylov methods and the Newton methods are in the, in the subdirectory MFEM examples Petsy. So this is an example of using MFEM to provide the discretization and mesh management capabilities and then using a Petsy uh, uh, algebraic solvers underneath. And the first problem in this direction, a directory is AEX2. Um, if you look, if you, you can just read through the example and you'll see that it's, uh, it's similar to what was uh, spoken about this morning, except rather than using a hyper solver, it's coded to use uh, the Petsy solvers. And so the only real difference to achieve that is okay, that's the finite element stuff there. Is it creates a, a, a Petsy parallel matrix and it creates a Petsy parallel um, precondition CG solver set some options for that, um, and then applies the solve. So I made a, a couple of examples. The first one, this is a, quite a difficult problem, a structural mechanics problem with a beam that is tough for uh, linear algebra solvers. So, oh, I forgot something. In order to run these examples, it's best to use the bash shell. So the first thing to do, like the instructions say, Let's start up bash. <clears throat> 
So if I run that example, see what happens. Well, I hardwired this one to have a max iterations of 25. And if you look at the output, you'll see that after 25 iterations, it's, it's struggling and really hasn't gotten anywhere in terms of converging that system. And that's because it's pretty ill-conditioned and using um, the default CG with um, Jacobi preconditioning just won't converge. Now, the next case says to run it with what it's hardwired for, which is uh, using an algebraic multigrid from Petsy. It ran quite well. You see that it took uh, 31 iterations, but the uh, residual norm, as measured in what's called the natural norm for conjugate gradient method, went from 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 12. So obviously, this preconditioner works very well for this problem, while other preconditioners um, uh, like Jacobi don't converge that well. I have a few other uh, test cases you can run with different preconditioners and accelerators to see how they work. And then finally, I just wanted to show you the last, um, the last example which MFEM is solving using um, is actually a time, de de time dependent problem, but it's nonlinear. I'm just going to show you the effect on the, um, the uh, nonlinear solves, not the time dependent part. So we're running this guy. Let's see what happens here. Okay, so what I want you to do is just look at the convergence for the nonlinear solver here. And notice that at the third iteration, the residual norm is 10 to the minus 5, and the next one is 10 to the minus 8, and then it's 10 to the minus 13. So you're seeing this effect of quadratic convergence um, that you don't have for the simple iterative schemes. And you can, you can play with all the examples that are in this directory and play with various Petsy options for different solvers. Um, so I just left a couple of minutes for questions, but uh, are there any questions? Yep. What would you consider the current state of the art for solving a Poisson equation? The what? For the Poisson equation? It depends totally on, on your situation. So if you can use FFTs, use FFTs, they'll kick butt. But they, you can only use them on nice meshes you know, that are uh, uniform and all that other good stuff. Um, whenever possible, you want to use geometric multigrid because that's kind of the second best. And it can also it'll work very, extremely well for, for, for many situations. But if you start to have really deformed meshes, funny scalings, and so forth, then you have to switch to algebraic multigrid. And the advantage for algebraic multigrid, well, it'll converge pretty well independent of your mesh and all that other kind of stuff. But it has much, much, much more setup time than um, geometric or FFT. And it, um, it's also will require a few more iterations. And each iteration is more, is more expensive. But almost always, it's going to be one of those three, I would say, unless you're doing a very specialized case like um, um, well, there's a few very specialized things that, that would use something else, but it's pretty much always those. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. <laughs>